Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the uh, video teaching series, The Love of God, and this is part three of that series. And so this, this series is entitled The Second Commandment, Loving Others. This is lesson number five of uh, part three, The Second Commandment, Loving Others. And the title of this lesson is Love works for us, then works through us. Love works for us, then through us. Uh, biblically, it is impossible to separate love and faith. I cannot love God without having faith in him. If he loved me and I love him in return, it's impossible for me not to have faith in him. The word faith here uh, implies far more than mental, mentally acknowledging his existence. Far more than that. Far more than that. His, uh, the, the, the word faith implies uh, or is actually defined as uh, clinging to, relying upon, trusting in, being fully committed to. So I cannot have, how can I receive the love of God and love him in return with that love and that not produce confidence in him and confidence in his word and confidence in his abilities and confidence in his willingness to, uh, to do to us, for us, and through us all according to his will for our good, but also especially for the good of the kingdom of God. How can we not have faith? Paul said it this way in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision of, uh, availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. The Amplified reads this way, For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith activated and energized and expressed and working through love. And finally, we expand the translation of the New Testament says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision is, is of any power nor uncircumcision, but faith coming to effective expression through love. Now this is very, very important. It's very important because this is a... Uh, an invaluable eternal principle. I cannot ignore this principle and, and please God, have a relationship with God, and be used of God as his conduit. I can't do it. It's impossible. I cannot have faith apart from his love, but according to the Greek construction here, which, of course, the Amplified gives us a real uh, uh, look at, Emphasize, amplified says, but faith, but only faith activated and energized and expressed and working through love. So faith worketh by love. All of that is in the word worketh in defining the relationship between faith and love. Which comes faith? Faith first, faith or love? Well, if You've been listening to these previous lessons. That question is a given. I have to receive God's love for me to even have faith in him. I have to believe God loves me to even have faith in him. How can I believe that God wants to do or give to someone that he hates? He doesn't. So, the first and foremost thing I've got to do to become all that God would have me to be in him or even begin to become, I've got to, to have faith in God. I first have to have the love of God, and I have to first acknowledge the love of God. He loves me. And how many times and places in these lessons in part one, in part two, and now in part three, have we, uh, have we covered scriptures that proved that God loved us even when we were his enemies? God loved us even when we were the enemies of the cross. When we lived 
in contradiction to the word of God and the will of God. God loved us. That also proves that man's definition of love is not God's definition of love. Because God can love someone so so much that he died for them and yet not approve of their life. He loved us enough. If if his love was so unconditional that uh, 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 he loved us exactly like we are, he didn't have to die for that. From a human perspective, he didn't have to die to, to provide for our salvation. If he loves us so unconditionally, there's never anything that we can or need to do in response to that love. But he died for his enemies. Is it okay with him if we stay, if we stay his enemies? He died for sinners. Is it okay for him for us to continue to live in sin? Not if you read Romans 5, 6, and 7. It's not okay. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. So if I I have to believe God loves me, I, that's why I've got to believe the gospel before I can believe anything else. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but that's not truly, fully the gospel. The gospel is, the, the full good news is, God loves me so much that he died for me, was buried and rose again, ascended to heaven, and he's willing to forgive my sins and save me. That's the gospel. We can't start with the death, burial, and resurrection in the gospel. We have to start with the love of God, who, who and what initiated all of this. So faith works by love. It's energized by love. So if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> if I'm trying to believe God, separate and apart from the love of God, that's called religion. And I'm trying to love God by the rules and regulations I keep. And I make those statements and people say, then, you, then you're a compromiser because you don't believe the word. I believe all the word of God. And I believe all the word of God is important including holiness and its outward sign separation. I believe all that's part of what God produces in and through us. I believe all that. But when I turn the word of God and the intent of God into rules and regulations that the religious can keep, and as long as they're keeping the rules, they can run their own life, do their own thing, live any other way. Anything that's not express, expressly forbidden or anything that's not expressly required, the rest of it is mine to decide. Where do you get that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? And that's what happens when you turn the, the, the shalls and shall nots into do's and don'ts. They become, they, they become the rules of religion. They become the rules of religion. That's not pleasing to God. That is not pleasing to God. Because I can't obey the shalls and shall nots. Except I receive the love of God first. And the love of God empowers me to do what I cannot do myself. Because there's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. And John, that's, uh, that's, that's R- 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 uh, Romans 3. 1 John 1 says, If you say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. He was talking to the church. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And He spoke that to the saved. Not to the unsaved, to the saved. Everything Paul wrote in Romans was to the church. He was explaining to the church, about their whole, why they needed salvation and what the Lord did to provide salvation and how they, what they, what they did to receive, uh, what they did in, in obedience to receive salvation and what that's supposed to mean in their lives. All, he explained all that, but he was explaining it to the church. It just, it would be absolutely fall in the floor hilarious if it wasn't eternally tragic to hear so many Christians point absolute sinners to the book of Romans so they can find out how to be saved. 
boy, you got to really try hard to keep people in mystery so that you can define salvation your way instead of the biblical way. That's exactly the purpose of that. And then what's the, what's, which one is the four, uh, of the four Gospels do they point sinners to? The Gospel of John. I love the Gospel of John. But John and Romans are two of the very deepest spiritual books in the entire Bible. There are people that have been Christians all their lives that really don't understand those two books. And we're going to point sinners to John and Romans? Well, of course we do. Because they book in Acts and we don't want people looking at Acts. Because if they read Acts, then they'll begin to compare us to Acts and they're going to ask questions we can't answer. So you start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're a lot easier, a lot more palatable, a lot easier for people to understand. And then, then you go to Acts. And after all of that, that someday you'll be able to come back to John and fully receive it, and Romans and fully dig out the depths of it, you and the Holy Ghost. But not so. So Paul says, for in Christ, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. I, I haven't qualified myself because I'm keeping the, the rules and the law and the do's and don'ts, and I haven't disqualified myself because I haven't. Because the qualifier is for in Jesus Christ. You know, what does that mean? Well, Galatians 3.27 says, For as many as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And nobody is in Christ that hasn't been baptized into Christ. And then, uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So, we are baptized by water into Christ, but we are also Spirit baptized into the body. So not only does water baptism and spirit baptism affect us personally, but in the bigger picture, in the grand scheme of things, when we are water baptized, we're baptized into Christ. And then by the Spirit of God, we are baptized, that is baptized into us. That makes us a part of the body. So outside of those, uh, all of the religion I participate in avails and pr produces nothing. And all of my irreligiousness does not hinder me because all of it comes under the name and the blood and the, and the, and the word of God, the spirit of God. and the, It all comes under God. It all comes under the love of God because God is love. And so faith works for us. And then the purpose of us learning that faith works for us is to learn that faith then will work through us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Love with faith. Paul makes that very specific. Love with faith. And I'm asking again. Is it possible to have the love of God without then having faith in God? Because love activates, operate, causes to be operative, energizes, and exercises faith through us. Everything that happens through us that is truly of God is the love of God working that through us. It's not me living for God. It's not me working for God. It is me as a conduit of the Father letting His love that He gave me, we love Him because He first loved us, letting His love that He gave me activate and operate faith through me. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. But the question then is this, <laughs> can I have faith without having and knowing I have the love of God in my life? That's why a lot of people pray prayers, but they pray religious prayers. 
And they don't really get answers for them. That's why a lot of people that are Christians have given up on prayer as anything more than an obligatory activity that they do because they're required and expected to do it, but they have no ex, no real, if they were totally honest with themselves and with God, they have no real expectations that God is going to do anything when they pray. So that means there's no faith operating. So if there's no faith operating and faith operates love, or love operates faith, then I, I think it's very reasonable to ask the question, is the love of God really there? We can't hold the love of God prisoner. God's bigger than us. I think that goes without saying, right? So if God is bigger than us and God is love, and we have the love of God, but we've got no faith, We've got no expectancy in our communication with him because prayer is communication with God. We talk to him, he talks back. It's communication. And it's not biblical prayer unless it's two-way communication. And if there's no two-way communication, there's no faith because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the church at Ephesus the church at Ephesus that received in Paul's letter to them some of the greatest, most powerful revelations that God has ever given to anybody. And thank God it wasn't just kept private between uh, Paul and the Holy Ghost and the, the church at Ephesus. Thank God it was put in the book and because we're all in the body, it belongs to us too. But look what happened to Ephesus the first part of Revelation 2, God warned them, said, you, you got all the doctrine stuff down and you, you're, you are uh, jealous to make sure that nobody who claims to be an apostle is not truly an apostle and, uh, and all that. But uh, I have somewhat against you. And what is that? In my opinion, my opinion, the greatest accusation or condemnation or, uh, that God could ever make against any individual or church, you have left your first love. And what's your first love? Receiving the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving the love of God in my life, unconditionally, that I give back to him and he gets all the glory for it. And they left all that. And they, they left behind all the revelation that faith works by love and that everything has ever happened through them that God does, he does by faith. But faith doesn't do it except it is operated, activated and operated by the love of God in and through us. And he told them to repent lest he remove their candlestick. I wonder how many of us have been around long enough that our love for the Lord has grown stale. That's not possible. We call it growing stale. But in God, it's either there or it's not there. Because God is God and God is love. Uh, we either have the love of God and, or we, are, uh, we don't have the love of God. One or the other. That's the case. One or the other. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, which I will cover in several lessons, uh, that chapter uh, later on in this series. Uh, for the love of Christ constraineth us, but because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You talk about the principle of the gospel. It's all contained there, and I'm not going to comment on that now. You look forward. There, I will actually spend four lessons in this series uh, on 2 Corinthians 5. 1 John 5 says, uh, verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. 
<laughs> and, 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 and how many times, not out of boredom or lack of trust, but out of a sense of urgency and, and, and a desire to, for us not to miss the point, how many different ways have, uh, have we, how many scriptures have we read in all these these lessons? Seventeen lessons in uh, in, in part one, and I, I think it was ten or twelve lessons in part two. Ten lessons, I think, in part two, and now here we are in part three. That's going to have uh, uh, thirteen lessons, and uh, and how many times already have we read verses that from all kind of different directions, very directly, and sometimes. Uh, a little bit from the oblique. It, it, it's making this point over and over and over again. And then somebody go, comes along and reads this verse completely out of context of all the other verses. Whoever believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God. Okay, praise God. I believe. Really. But Jesus said in John 7, 37 through 38... In the last day of the great, great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, Let if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this big key of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, and the word there in the Greek is it's a necessity for him to receive. Should and ought are, are, are translated from that same Greek word in many places. It's a necessity. The only reason it says should instead of uh, shall or, or should it rather than uh, ought to or, or, or has whatever is because it wasn't yet available. But this speak ye of the Spirit which they believe on him should receive, but the Holy Ghost was not yet given because the Lord wasn't yet glorified. But how do we believe? How did Jesus say we believe? As the scripture hath said. So I can't take this verse and say, there it is. All I have to do is believe and I'm born of God. No. What does it mean biblically to, be, to believe? What does it biblically mean to be born of God because you believe? Paul said in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. 1, 2, 3 I think it is. Uh, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on under to perfection or completion or maturity in our relationship with God. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works of faith toward God. Look at that order. Of repentance from dead works of faith toward God. Of the doctrine singular of baptisms, plural, of laying on of hand of eternal uh, 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 resurrection dead and eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit, and he does. It's his will. But notice that. That's the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Can I be born of God if I don't even believe and practice the seven principles of the doctrine of Christ? The seven foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ? I don't think so. So, but Paul is making the point here about love. God is love. And he just went into some of the deepest teaching on it in the previous chapter, 1 John 4. So he's summing up here, whosoever believeth that, Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, if I love God, I loveth also that is begotten of him. Now, some translations actually say, point that to Christ. And we, if we love God, we love Christ. <clears throat> well, since God, Christ is <clears throat> God manifested in the flesh, I don't think you can divide those two. So therefore, uh, since Christ is the only visible representation of the invisible God for eternity, uh, I don't think that's a point that was necessary to be made. So what does it say? And we... And so that next verse kind of clarifies that. Everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him or born of him. We are born again. That's what it's talking about. Whoever believes that Jesus the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that did the begetting, loves also that are also born of God. By this, we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, 
and keep his commandments. Because we know of at least two, we're talking about those. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or know who God is, and, a, and, and respond to that by loving him with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those are two commandments. If you don't obey those two commandments, it doesn't matter whatever other commandments you make because the whole law, according to Jesus, hangs those, those, on those two. So it does not matter what else I do in obedience to the word of God. If I'm not obeying those two commandments, the rest of it is worthless. Those, oh, my obedience to those two commandments by the empowerment of the love of God and through the love of God only makes everything else I do or not do of value. Without my obedience to those two, I have no value. Verse 3, and my obedience has no, my obedience, my religiosity has no value. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You mean the faith that operates, is activated by love? It's activated and operated by love? You mean that faith? Yes, that faith. Verse 5. For who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Right. First Thessalonians 1 and 3 says this. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, <laughs> I, uh, I'm by the Holy Ghost. As your apostle, I'm remembering without ceasing, remembering in prayer and giving thanks for your Work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope. Are those three different things we're trying to accomplish there? Three different things the Lord's requiring us to do? Or are those three different things describing different aspects of the same life being lived by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that, uh, is that the case? Is that the case? And finally, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold or many different types of temptations or testings, that the trial of your faith, being, so, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. And the word end there is also uh, uh, related to the word is translated perfect or come to completion, brought to, brought to the end point, to the end goal of maturity and trustworthiness. So the trial of your faith. Do you think you or I can pass any testing of our faith without the confidence of the love of God? Isn't that what Paul, uh, John said in 1 John chapter 4, 16? Chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, we have known experientially and believed, trusted in, relied upon the love of God. And verse 17 says, uh, Here is our love made perfect, that we may have confidence. As King James says, boldness. Confidence in the day of judgment. And the Greek word there is K-R-I-S-I-S, -I -I crisis. Yeah. So the trial of our faith it's only possible for our faith to be tested for us to pass the test and our faith to pass the test if the love of God is in us and we have a relationship with God through his love and we have a, we, we're, 
we're participating in ministry, that ministry is his love flowing through us to our neighbor, the lost, our brother, our sister, and the lost. Jesus' name. At whom, and speak, let me read that again, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love. That's, that's amazing. How can I love somebody I haven't seen? Well, I haven't seen Jesus Christ. I'll never see God. No man has seen God at any time. No man ever will see God. God's a spirit. Even in eternity, we won't see God, except that we will see him in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. The man Christ Jesus is the only visible representation of the infinite I am, God the Father, forever. But we haven't, Peter did. He saw Jesus. John talked about in 1 John chapter 1, you know, we, we have seen him, we've touched him, we've heard, you know, I, okay, John, rub it in, rub it in. We, I haven't. I haven't, John. Peter, thank you for acknowledging that you saw him. You were baptized by him. You heard his voice naturally and spiritually. I haven't. That's faith. Faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's uh, Hebrews. In uh, Romans, Paul said, uh, we're saved by hope, but why are we hoping for something we already see? So I haven't seen Jesus. So I'm saved by hope, and hope there is not wishing to be saved. The Greek word and concept of hope the biblical concept of hope in the Greek word means something completely different than wishing. It means having confident expectation, which is actually a step beyond faith. Faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope is the confident expectation of actually seeing it in your spirit take place and knowing it's going to happen. Knowing it's going to happen. And so Paul summarizes all of this with saying, verse 9, receiving the end or the completion or the maturity of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So if as some teach I'm saved at confession of my faith and I can't be lost, that was the end of my faith right there. Because if that's when I'm saved, that's the end of my faith. But if that's not the case, if as Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, I think it is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Or that Paul said that, Peter said something similar to that. Why? If salvation is guaranteed and I can't possibly be lost, I mean, when I, I chose to get saved, but now I've lost my right to choose. I can't choose to walk away from God. Not according to some fit, folks. I lost my will. That free moral agency no longer exists once I'm saved. No, sir, buddy. After that, I am lost forever. Come on now. Come on. I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm trying to get you to think. I'm trying to get you to think. It's not even biblically sound. It's not biblically sound. You have to take a few verses here and there completely out of the context of the whole Bible to teach such a thing as that. There's such an abundance of scriptures that prove I mean, what was Peter talking about at the end of chapter 2 of 2 Peter? About the dog that was, uh, the sow that was washed returning to her wallowing in the mire and the dog returning to his vomit again. What is, what's Peter talking about there? If I can't go back to any of that, what, what, was he delusional? No. So, I need to love God. I need to let the love of God love through me because it's only the love of God that got me to the place of beginning this salvation journey 
And it's only the love of God that will see me through to the end. He that endureth unto the end, same Greek word there for receiving the end of your faith. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. If I can't be lost, there's no enduring necessary. No matter what my struggles and problems are, no matter whether I ever repent or even pray, I can't be lost because I've said the words. Now God is obligated to save me no matter how I choose to live. That's not true. It's not true. It's not biblically true. But I thought God loves us. He does. He, but he loves us too much to not violate our will here and now. He gave you a will, and in the temporal time, he will never violate that will. And I, I don't come to God when I'm ready. I come when he calls. I have to choose to do that. But according to the Bible, I can choose also to walk away. I can choose to walk away. God's love works for us. God's love works through us. And God's love is what saves us as we yield to him. Second, in the, in the chapter Ephesians 2 that talks about his great love wherewith he loved us and, and describing what his love does in us, verse 10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works unto the praise of his glory. That's what we're called to be. That's what we're called to do. All by and through, because of, by and through the love of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would receive this word today. Receive it. If there's conflict in your mind or your spirit over this, go back to the word. I've, re I've provided in these lessons an abundance of scripture. Go back and read them again. Pray about them. Ask the Lord, Lord, tell me what you mean here. Explain this to me. I don't ever read the Bible without the author present, ever. Why? Because I don't want my intellect concluding what something means. I want him to explain to me what he means so that I have truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord bless you. Amen.